than us because he took a day off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hate to burst your bubble, but so did I. I lied. I quit my job. Right? <laughs> And that's not for the ego, I'm just saying what the knowledge I have to unlearn. And so when I was a young person, Marishi told us that there would be CC, Transcendental Consciousness, CC, GC, um, Unity. And so uh, the description of CC was, this transcending was, you know, no more from our thoughts, the self, no more the self without an object of perception. Cosmic Consciousness was witnessing, which you were talking about last night, wit witnessing, waking, dreaming, and sleeping. So the transcendent was along with waking, dreaming, and sleeping. God consciousness was seeing the finest particle structure of creation, the sap in the trees, the aura, the light, seeing everything with devotion, like how can I serve you, how can I be loving, being completely devoted to service. And then unity was just a thread called Laisha Vidya holding on the planet, which is maybe your experience, where you're not a body, you're one, like I am that, thou art that, or this is nothing but that. And the only reason you're still even incarnated is because this little thread that is your choice of when you go home or not, because you're just one you know, with everything. There's no, different, no differentiation. So he told us that he thought we would get there in five years. That was so funny. He was so disappointed. <laughs> he said, you Westerners, I don't know what you've done to your nervous systems. So I, I come from this background of, of thought and study for 25 years of all the sacred texts, the call beloved, Yogi Vasishtha, Tiam, Buddhism, blah, blah, blah. And I'm and I need to unlearn it all is what you're saying. <laughs> I just need to let it go and not be on a if I do this I'll have that and just surrender it all. All of my work. Yes. Yes. You have to, to know God. Yes, exactly. You have to empty your mind of everything. And my other message is it's fun. It's fun to let go of it all. Oh, it's fun to empty, to be empty of all these concepts and thoughts, even the so-called spiritual yeah, ones. Because they're kind of trapping. Because I yeah. always would feel bad that I wasn't in CC or you know, unity. And I ha I've had experiences for three weeks at a time where I could see the finest particle structure of creation. And that was trippy, but it didn't last and it didn't bring me bliss. It was just that I know we're not what we appear to be. And so that's a great thing, but it doesn't make me happy all the time. You know what I mean? Which is what we want, and we want to be giving that out to everybody. So I, I was like a little frustrated. Well, a lot frustrated. <laughs> 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 so then I came to the course and I thought, okay, well then where is this going to put Marishi stuff? Because I thought that we would just like, get cruise into God conscious and community. And so it, it's saying, no, you need to make a choice. You need to choose to surrender and plug into God in this way and the story and ask Holy Spirit to take all the stuff between you as it stops you. Okay. One more question. <laughs> Which brings up the layer of the, the guilt and the sorrow. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but when things happen to me, and I might cry, so I hope everybody's okay mm -hmm. with crying. <laughs> but when, <laughs> but when, when I was a little girl, when I was nine, my dad died in front of me of a heart attack, and it was very. And this is just a story, like you said, your story mm -hmm. of you, and, mm -hmm. and he said. So my story is that I, um, I really missed him, and my mother was quite a tyrant, and and she we're okay now. But at that time, there was a lot of physical abuse from when I was nine to fourteen, big time. So I knew when my dad left, I wasn't safe. And that's what I told myself, a decision. So I think the whole rest of my life I've been looking for a daddy or a man to keep me safe because I didn't feel safe when he left. So as a result of that, every time somebody leaves, it seems like there's this ancient wound, ancient wound that there's so much pain that comes up and it doesn't go away. And it doesn't seem like it's just what happened. It doesn't seem in proportion to the event. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But every time somebody leaves, whether it's a, a boyfriend or my son, it, my son's incarcerated and my mom's leaving through Alzheimer's and dementia, and my boyfriend has six years left, and went in, and I lose myself, I forget. Mm -hmm. I forget my changeless. Mm -hmm. And then I work really hard to do the course, but 
fuck did I forget? <laughs> so, I'm just wondering if all this hurting is just the guilt and the ego, but that looks like hurt because I project it and I make it about them, and it's not about them, right? right. Even though it looks like sounds like it's about them. <laughs> yes, it's a very deep, it's a deep, deep, deep belief in abandonment. Yeah, and it, and it actually goes back. <laughs> To God, even though it's projected out, and many people seem to leave us parents, you know, either leave or, death, or, or through divorce death or, or divorce, or uh, partners change. leave, yeah. children leave. Yeah. You know, there's this a lot of it's a sense of loss, too. Loss and abandonment is are, yeah. are what we're really looking at. Yeah. yeah, and and the deeper belief is, um, is it's such so buried over with this world, but it's the belief that you could actually leave God or that God could leave you. And it gets projected in many different ways. Uh, Helen Chuckman, who was the scribe of the Course, uh, wrote a lot of poetry. And she titled it The Gifts of God. And she was uh, had the same feelings you're talking about. Not so much with, uh, with her biological father or in relationships, but with Jesus. Uh, this deep thing, like, how could you leave us here? Uh, you know, how could you go ascend to, to the right hand of the Father and, and say, I am with you always, and then you're gone. Yeah. Uh, maybe like the apostles felt after it was a three years of a rocky ride, uh, hanging on <laughs> with this guy and everything he was talking about. But then their writings, even in the New Testament, you know, had some bitterness and anger in there. I mean, because their master, you know, seemed to be yeah. strung up on the cross and then yeah. come back briefly. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of time. But still, not in a body. Not in a body. Yeah. Uh, there's a teacher, uh, Yogananda, you know, uh, when he, he sat down with his uh, disciples there at that supper and everything and says, yeah, it's been great yeah. and everything, but I'm out of here. <laughs> gasp, a gasp, <laughs> uh, as the body remained in a state of non-decay, but there was no animated uh, Yogananda figure there. So what you're tapping into, Margo, is this very, very deep-seated sense of abandonment and loss that really goes back to the belief that you could separate from God. And then as soon as that belief seems to have taken effect, as soon as you believe you've actually accomplished the impossible, then a new God is set up, the ego's God, an anthropomorphic uh, God, a God with human emotions. And also... Could you, could you define of, anthro... Anthropomorphic is, is ascribing uh, human attributes to God. The non-human. The non-human entity. So, so what, what's anthro? Can you break it down for me? Uh, um, I just know the meaning of it. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, ego is just, wow, what's yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like taking anything that isn't sentient. Yeah. Sentient. Does that help? No, that's good. I, I get the gist of it. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So basically, the ego has projected all this onto God. That, and of course, the Old Testament of the Bible is loaded with it. You know, God zapping tribes and playing favorites left and right, even though. There is a line in the Old Testament that God has no favorites, but most of the stories <laughs> actually look like he's got a lot of favorites. Mm -hmm. And uh, what Jesus really came to say was God is the God of love. Uh, God loves you unconditionally. It's the, the whole prodigal son story that was repeated over and over was that no matter what you think you've done about throwing away your inheritance or ruining your family name or blowing it, uh, that God loves you no matter what. And God will come rushing down the road to meet you if you even make a turn uh, towards God and go back towards this beautiful, abstract, loving spirit. So this abandonment thing just has been played out for centuries and centuries and millennium in the sense that in other realms and on and on of this belief that, that the, the separation, which is really a mind thing, is being enacted in form. In people. In people. It's so boring. It's yeah. like, it's like a boring. <laughs> can we change the tape? Right. You know, you can see the pattern. Like oh my God, somebody else is leaving. Yeah, and it just feels like the tape is just like, come on, I need this to stop. So yeah. what if you explored that deeper, like if you, if you went into that, so that you could, like instead of denying it and saying, I, I, I should be past this, I, I you know, I've dealt with this before and whatever, well, that was my next question, because Sarah's always saying, and, I, and Pat's really good at it, but I don't know that I know how to do it, just bring it to Holy Spirit. So, so when, I, when I go home into my house, and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, my partner, oh my God, 
because it's just like there's this presence, this shadow. It's like a limb. The limb is still here, but he's mm -hmm. not here. So then do I say, like, tell me how to say. Then do I sit down with my eyes open or do I sit down with my eyes closed and say, Holy Spirit, I'm noticing that I'm grieving. I give this to you. I'm noticing I'm sad and lonely. I'm telling myself stories. I choose to let that go. Instead, I choose to rest in God. Or like, how do I do it? How do I give it to him? How do I say what's in my heart? All the illusion of the ego. Mm -hmm. Well, what she's saying too about go into it is is when the emotions come up, right. uh, the important thing is not to stuff them back okay. down, not to repress them, suppress them. And then also the temptation, as soon as they seem to come up, is the ego immediately wants to project it out to a cause and form. Uh, Chris left, I miss him, I, I feel abandoned, I feel a sense of loss, I feel a sense of grief. And ego wants to tie that feeling into some event in the world, but it's not. In fact, you can't feel loss unless you believe in loss. Loss is a belief of the ego, of course. There's no uh, loss in the Holy Spirit, but the ego believes in loss. Uh, so this is where the emotions come up, and really when we say turn it over to the Holy Spirit, it's not like there's a catchphrase, or if I could just say it the right way, or I'm in the right posture, or, or whatever. I try this, usually. That has explored these different things. What it really is, is um, every day is a full plate of these emotions uh, coming up. And uh, the Course is saying, you don't have to go on a witch hunt for them. Uh, just daily life. <laughs> they're, uh, there. they're there. They're there. <laughs> they're right there, yeah, right. It's like wading through them. Yeah, and the key is to not try to uh, protect them or guard them or hold them in. Uh, that's why, you know, it's okay to cry. It's okay to let those emotions pour out. I have a question in relation to what Margot's asking. I remember when I went through what she was going through. And um, I was just learning the course, and it seemed like I was going doing the work, yet the pain remained really constant. And uh, one of my counselors who introduced me to the Course kept uh, referring me, he says, when, when in deep waters become a diver, like be with it, be with it. So I, I kept being with it, but I, I cried for six months. I, the pain was so excruciating, like I mean, I want a death almost compared to the pain. But I truly was with the pain, like I, I don't know, if maybe at some level I might have been resisting. But it didn't. I didn't seem to get that that uh, immediate relief. A couple of times when I was talking to uh, David Ott, the guy who got me into the course, he transcended something where I had like ab from absolute pain to absolute peace. I maintained that peace for three or four hours. So I had a proof that okay, this whatever he's talking about at that time, which I had no clue, was working. Yeah. So that it gave me enough faith to keep to keep at it. I sometimes get a f um, wonder if it's just not the time heals all wounds, where it's become kind of my ego's bored with <laughs> all this pain stuff, and it's time to move on. And it's been you know a couple of years now. Uh, you know, to, to say that would be a, kind of a downplaying the course and all the work it's or all the results I've gotten from it. But I just remember where Margot was and that offering and offering. He's, you know, there's a song that uh, goes when you're in the storm, tie yourself to the mass. My friend in the storm will end. Kind of like ride it out, kind of an attitude. Uh, so basically, all I ended up doing was just keep working the course, keep working the course. Now it's become very easy, but I'm not in that place of desperation. So despaired and desperate at the same time, where, you know, I was just, oh, anything, anything, and nothing was enough. Till, you know, I'd cry myself to sleep or I'd. Uh, I hadn't slept in three days, and then I'd pass out, and I'd wake up from a bad dream. It was just completely violent and, and cruel. So when, when someone's in that state, it's a state of insanity. Do you, have, do you have a suggestion or maybe a piece of advice that if I'm ever faced with someone who, who needs that kind of counseling, what, what piece of advice may I offer on the, besides, you know, time will do its thing and just hang in there? Yeah. The last time I was here, I... I brought out this thing called Instrument for Peace, which is a 12-step right. uh, thing to work through, process to work through, and it's online. I have, we have tons of resources okay. and materials, but it's online. I don't think we, I don't know that we have any uh, of those with us. Or mm -hmm. I don't think we do, but 
But anyway, that was the stepping thing to start off with uh, what you were perceiving and your emotions and really getting it out uh, on paper. I, and I designed it to literally guide the mind through the, the steps of, of bringing it inward and releasing it. And I was able to squeeze it down into 12 steps. And then a lot of times people would use that and, and practice it with anything, anytime you're upset. Um, in fact, I even went so far as, I, I don't know that we even make these anymore, but I, years ago, I, the Course teaches that pleasure and pain are the same. They're two sides of the same coin. And, and Jesus says at one point, it's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. Mm -hmm. So it's, the ego never wants that raised to awareness. It wants you to you know, keep getting the, chasing the fool's gold, getting disappointed, mm -hmm and then going back and chasing some more fool's gold so you'll stay uh, stuck in the guilt and, and it'll stay in business, so to speak. So I even had one called, uh, it was Instrument for Peace, but it was Healing the Pleasure. Uh, healing the Pleasure. I, always, I had a group of flock of students following me around. I said, uh, you want to do a workshop that will really be lightly attended. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> healing the Pleasure. <laughs> Go to one of these metaphysical churches. And, <laughs> right, right, Healing the Pleasure, right. But, but I had a whole... Uh, sheet designed aimed at pleasure when I feel this pleasure you know and this and that because it's it's just a distraction again from coming to peace to, to coming to non-judgment so another thing I talked about last night was rules for decision which is basically the only value of allowing those intense emotions to come into awareness is that you have an impetus uh, to change your mind uh, mm -hmm. they don't feel good and anybody who, who says just let them come in and be with them uh, and, and if you end up with them for, for weeks or months or six years you know it's like it's a little bit of sacrifice and suffering like martyrdom like woe is right. me <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm being with this pain I've been with it for yeah. for six years the course is not asking you to suffer what you know, a trooper there's no price in suffering no. there's nothing to be gained it's, gain it's by truly suffering. optional yeah. but at the beginning the Holy Spirit knows that you're so invested in suffering mm -hmm. that the contrast you get it's not why we're here. Like, why did we all? Why, we're all one. We're all. Everything is 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 perfect har harmony and peace with God. That's what's real. Why are we here in this pain? Like, why are we in this? You know. Yes. It's a dream of incarnation. Why are we this dream? It's a dream why do we of, want the of dream? believing that you can be a divine mind and go wandering off into time and space. Is it? Is that the dream? The dream is to that we are here. We are in this dream, but the real dream is to be a divine with the divine mind. Well, I would say that divine mind is purely abstract, so it has nothing to do with dreaming. But what you're doing here is going from being a dream figure or being on the screen, so to speak. Like if you watch a movie and you got Richard Gere over there and Julia Roberts and whatever, you're going from being a dream figure first to being the dreamer of the dream, very empowering. When you're the dreamer of the dream, it doesn't matter what's going on in that dream. Because you know that it's a dream. You're very happy. You're a happy dreamer. Uh, the, the Course says the Holy Spirit needs happy learners. You're a happy learner when you're back as the dreamer. And then poof, God takes the final step. The dream, it, you wake up from the dream. It goes from being a nightmare of suffering to a happy dream of non-judgment to yeah. poof, no dream at all. Yeah. Uh, I have, I no have a images. lot of, I, I, it's a real stumbling block for me to read that, you know, it never says in that book of Genesis or whatever that, that uh, Adam woke up. Yes. So we're still in this dream when Jesus put him, to, or God put him to sleep. We're still, God didn't put it. Well, no, well, no, but, I mean, that's what it says. It he says went he went to sleep. He fell asleep. He yeah. fell asleep, and it never says anywhere that he woke, woke up. Woke up. That's the fall from grace, yeah. But there is a wake up call in the New Testament. I and the Father are one. Before Abraham was, I am. This is a mind awake. Uh, uh, or we could say at the most, uh, at the, or at the very least, aware that it's a dream. And be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. I'm not a dream figure anymore. I'm the dreamer. Good news, everyone. Uh, this is a dream. And uh, I'm not special. What I've done, you shall do as well. Uh, you know, I, seemingly Jesus was just the first to reach the point of being the dreamer. And at that point, forgive them for they know not what they do. It doesn't matter. 
And then add stick spikes in the body, do whatever you want, whip it, tear it up. Of course, if you've seen the Passion of the Christ, how bloody can a body get? <laughs> and it doesn't matter, though, if you're the dreamer of a dream, and it's a dream. Because you you're not the body. Because you're not That's the body. Why he, so he didn't suffer. No, no, no. No, 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 that was suffering. no suffering whatsoever. It's not about suffering. Right, it's it, not it's about not suffering. About it's about suffering. joy. Yeah. Yeah. It's about happiness. But I mean, and it's truly about right. suffering. It's backed up so far out of his body with yeah. God that it's like, whatever. Right. This is not going. Like you said, yeah. I, the body appears to be going to Edmonton. The body <laughs> appears to be traveling yeah, all over the, the world. The parable of David. It's yeah. just a parable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I am not that. Yes. I am spirit. So, so when he guess, says, forgive them for they know not what they do, it's not even about that? It's not even about forgive them for they know not what they do? Well, Pat, uh, we translated Pat, you have to, we have a Patism from last night. Uh, we translated that very line into... Forgive them for they didn't do anything. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, there we go. That was excellent, Pat. <laughs> yeah, they didn't do anything. Yeah, they just had fun with some carpentry and nails. It's so uh, good. <laughs> I've never read the Bible because any time I've made an attempt at it, which isn't very often, it just seems so ridiculous to me. <laughs> uh, but I'm curious about the, the early days of Adam and Eve and that history and how people lived to be 609. What, what's that really about? Early, <laughs> early man, like you get early ancient times in the Bible and then you get the history of the evolution of man through... Science, uh, you know. Who is the reporter writing it all down? If there's only two, yeah, an inspired person. <laughs> well, Eventually. you might say that uh, Adam and Eve uh, are as fictitious as uh, David or Pat or uh, any mm -hmm. all the persons throughout all of time. The, the billions and billions and billions that have seemed to come and gone are all part of the fiction. Uh, so it's not who was real and who wasn't. Uh, and, and really the real question comes with any parable then, does it inspire, does it bring illumination, does it help you remember that you're a divine mind, a divine being? Well, I, I can understand that story of Adam and Eve, but I'm, I'm referring more to the ancients, like there's a whole lineage in the Bible. Mm -hmm. yeah. The body is a projection of the ego. The five senses are all tied in with the ego. Everything. It's like that old book that people told me about, something like John Gets Your Gun or something, where he seems to be wounded in some war, and so the whole book is him discovering, as he goes through the whole book, that he's blind. He can't see, and he can't hear, and he can't feel. <laughs> he goes through all the five senses, and he realizes that he's, he's got none of his five senses, not one. <laughs> but he still exists. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And so, and you get to the Course and you start doing that workbook and Jesus says, the body's eyes were made not to see. The body's ears were made not to hear. Ah, ooh, this is interesting stuff. Everyone's so concerned about losing their senses. Yeah, you can't lose them because they never were you in the first place. And this young man is blind and that's what she said, is that she still perceives differently than others because she doesn't see. It's beautiful when you really start to feel the joy welling up, you know. Uh, maybe the body's eyes can't seem to see. We had a great hug. That hug was coming from eternity. It's just you could feel the joy of eternity there expressing, because it even goes beyond the hug. It's, it goes right to the heart. It's right in the heart. And that's the beauty of, of this whole journey, is it takes you into the core of your very being. And that core was never born and can never die. That core doesn't really have anything to do with time. That the Holy Spirit uses time to teach that there is no time. It's not really a paradox, but it seems to be one. But it's like you feel these timeless moments. You know, we've all had those experiences where you're so in joy, so in love, that you lose track of time. You don't, you aren't aware of the passage of time. How glorious.